Good evening. Welcome all to this talk on compartment syndrome. To begin with, at the outset, I would like to tell you that there are very few emergencies in orthopedics, compartment syndrome being one of them. And the others being uh, open fractures and vascular injuries. With fractures in geriatric age group around the, around the hip forming semi-emergencies. So to begin with, we have to first know about four definitions with regard to compartment syndrome. What is an acute compartment syndrome? Acute compartment syndrome is basically an elevation of intracompartmental pressure to a level and duration which will lead to ischemia and necrosis of the tissue. Whereas a chronic uh, exertional compartment syndrome, which can be acute and chronic as well, it is associated mostly with exercise. So, which will lead to similar symptoms of ischemia, pain and neurological symptoms, which usually resolves with rest. But if, if the person continues the exercise or the triggering factor, it can lead to acute compartmental syndrome. Volkmann ischemic contracture is a sequelae of untreated acute compartment syndrome, usually seen in forearm, but can also be seen elsewhere. Whereas crush syndrome is a prolonged muscle compression on an extremity leads to systemic manifestation of muscle necrosis, wherein the degraded products trigger an inflammatory reaction and which can also lead to a systemic inflammatory syndrome or multi-organ dysfunction syndrome. So what is the incidence? About 7.3 males in 100,000 can be affected with and the female uh, incidence is about 0.7 meaning that there is a tenfold increased risk in men and the median age group is about 32 for men and 44 for women. The most common cause be it in adult or in pediatric age group is tibial diaphyseal fracture followed by soft tissue soft tissue injuries and distal radius fracture forming the third most common cause of uh, compartment syndrome it is said that 36% of acute compartment syndrome are due to tibial diaphyseal fracture whereas only 2.7 to 15% of tibial diaphyseal fractures are complicated by acute compartment syndrome what is the mechanism? Does mechanism of energy has any relation with acute compartment syndrome? It does have in the way in the in the way that low energy mechanisms, low energy injury mechanisms are more likely to cause uh, acute compartment syndrome because the intracompartmental boundaries are not affected. They are left intact. So thus, but in high energy injury mechanisms, usually the intracompartmental boundaries are disrupted. Thus, the uh, chances of developing ACS is much lesser in them. And it is, a, it is a misbelief that ACS cannot occur in open fracture. It can occur in open fracture, more with the lower gastrular type, lesser with the type 3, A, B and C. So these are the risk factors for development or late diagnosis of acute compartment syndrome. Demographic factors are usually, as we have seen, youth is affected with tibial fracture and uh, low energy tibial fracture, whereas high energy forearm and high energy femoral fractures can lead to ACS in forearm and thigh. A elderly patient on ecospin or clopidogrel is also predisposed for development of ACS, whereas polytrauma patients are not just predisposed for the development of ACS, but also predisposed for the late diagnosis of ACS. In children, there is an altered pain perception, which can lead to, uh, which can manifest in ACS. Whereas, iatrogenic ACS, even though the patient is on a PCA or on an epidural, can still be, still ACS can be seen in them. And it's usually said that the pain in the ACS can overcome the pain uh, PCA by the epidural or by uh, the analgesia. Thus, increasing demand for opiates or analgesics is said to be a subtle sign for of ACS. So, what is the pathogenesis? For that, we would have to go for Laplace law. Laplace law says that transmural pressure is equal to 
the constricting force divided by the radius of the vessel. So there is always a pressure that is acting, uh, 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 there is always a pressure which is due to the tension of the vessel wall, which is due to the smooth muscle of the vessel wall, which forms the constricting force of the TC force, uh, which, uh, which is when divided by the radius of the vessel leads to the transmural pressure. There is also another two theories which do say about the development of compartment syndrome. They are the AV gradient theory and microvascular occlusion theory. AV gradient theory says about the local blood flow which is the difference between the arterial pressure and the venous pressure divided by the radius and microvascular occlusion theory says that the occlusion of small vessels or capillary lead to further exudates or uh, which would further increase the permeability and will decrease the overall blood flow. One fact to remember is perfusion pressure is equal to di uh, diastolic blood pressure minus the intracompartmental pressure. So this pressure has to be somewhere more than 30 mmHg. If it is less than 30 mmHg, it is indicative of impending compartment syndrome and which would need a surgical intervention. So what are the effects of raised intracompartmental pressure? As we know that of muscle, bone and nerve, muscle is most sensitive to ischemia and critical tissue pressure threshold is said to be about 20 to 20 mmHg below the diastolic pressure or 25 to 30 mmHg below the mean arterial pressure and necrosis usually begins in the center and the amount of necrosis is proportional to the magnitude of the raised pressure and the duration for which it has been present. And type 1 fibers are more commonly affected than type 2 fibers. Type 1 fibers are commonly found in the anterior and lateral compartment of the leg whereas deep posterior compartment has type 2 fibers, especially the gastrocnemius, whose main metabolism is non-oxidative which is dependent on the fat. Whereas anterior and lateral compartment, the mechanism um, metabolism is more oxidative. Thus, the effect of uh, intra, uh, raised intracompartmental pressure is seen more on those compartments. So, as we as we take an surgical intervention and try to restore the blood supply, the blood is again flows back to the tissues where it has not been flown. That also causes another spectrum of injury called as reperfusion injury. So it's usually seen after fasciotomy and restoration of blood supply. The breakdown products of the inflammation, they activate the intrinsic clotting mechanism, which will again cause thrombosis in the small vessels, which will lead to increased permeability, further leading to an intracompartment pressure. This is like a vicious cycle, which complicates and which, which compounds the compartment syndrome. So these inflammatory products, they can also go into the systemic circulation and lead to multi-organ dysfunction. Clinical features of compartment syndrome, as we all know the six P's, pain, pallor, paresthesia, pulselessness, poikilothermia and paralysis, of which only pain is said to be an early symptom which, can, which is present in the earlier stages. Just all of the signs are late signs and by the time these signs are present, it's already the muscle has went into necrosis and they are sign of poor prognosis. So one important thing is uh, in prevention of uh, acute compartment syndrome is serial examination. One has to serially examine the patient and the local part to rule out or to prevent or to take an action against the compartment syndrome. So pain on palpation of the swollen compartment or the passive stretch is one of the common signs which is seen in the early stages, if not treated or if not taken action against, which will lead to a sensory deficit in the nerve, in the nerve uh, myo or dermatome, which would lead to other P's like pallor, paralysis, and paresthesia, which indicate a poor prognosis. In children, the signs will obviously be subtle as discussed before. Sensitivity of the pain is 19% and specificity of 9 is 97% and as it goes with all other parameters, all other clinical symptoms of acute compartment syndrome, sensitivity is much less and though they may be highly specific. So 
um, pain on passive strut is not a better clinical sign than rest pain it is similar to rest pain as has been found in multiple studies so as you can see the pain on passive stretch there another sign which can be seen in the late stages is blisters formation of blisters which is due to the lymphatic obstruction paresthesia and paralysis are late signs and it has been found uh, that there is a very common misbelief associated with acs that presence of pulses rules out acute compartment syndrome which is wrong acute compartment syndrome may also be present in the presence of pulses well bounding pulses an absent pulse with an acute compartment syndrome usually indicate that either it is a late case or there is an arterial injury which needs arteriography so how do we monitor compartment pressure wild white slides in his uh, classical experiment in 1860s used a needle manometer method where you insert a needle into the tissue which is connected to a three way stop cock which is connected to one part of it with an iv set is connected to the uh, ma manometer and the other part is connected with a syringe in which there is an air so with that we know about the amount of pressure in the in that particular compartment method now it is a better and a portable device called striker stick device where the needle can just be inserted and this device when connected to this needle piece will help us let uh, know the intra compartmental pressure this device is called micro porous catheter device in which we do a continuous pressure monitoring this is useful for uh, measuring the serial it's, it's useful in serial examination and continuous measurement of compartment pressure there have been recent developments like infusion of mannitol just as in case of intra, increased intracerebral pressure and increase infusion of mannitol can lead to an increase in bp which can lead to an elevation of uh, elevation in the diastolic blood pressure which would lead to increase in the delta p there are also serum markers like creatinine kinase or chloride levels or ischemia modified albumin which can predict the development of compartment syndrome but these markers are first thing they are in early stage of development and not yet been proven conclusively second thing is it may not always be possible given the time constraint for taking action in this emergency condition there has also been developed radio frequency identification chips which can be just be attached to the skin which would continuously detect changes in the compartment pressure and one device called near infrared spectroscopy which works similar to the pulse oximeter which when connected or which when attached to the skin on that particular compartment up to 3 cm it can show the amount of blood flow in that compartment it has been us fda approved in measuring brain and non traumatized tissue oxygen saturation it's also useful for continuous monitoring of the compartment pressure so this is the algorithm for uh, compartment syndrome so you have you have unequivocal positive findings pain pain on passive stretch and uh, intra compartmental pressure delta p less than 30 mm hg you go in directly for fasciotomy but if the patient is not alert and is a polytrauma victim and clinical findings could not be elicited you go in for measurement of compartmental pressure if the compartmental pressure delta p is less than 30 mm hg this delta p is nothing but a difference between the diastolic blood pressure and intra compartmental pressure icp delta p stands for the perfusion pressure so if delta p perfusion pressure is more than 30 mm hg what you do is you do a continuous compartmental monitoring either by microporous catheter or by near infrared spectroscopy that is a newer method not yet approved or you can do a serial clinical evaluation every half an hour to one hour to every two hourly 
In those case, if you clinically suspect strongly in favor of ACS, you can go in for fasciotomy. Or if while measurement perfusion pressure is less than 30, you go in for fasciotomy again. But if it is more than 30, you keep, uh, you keep observing the patient. So fasciotomy, while doing fasciotomy, you look for four C's, the color of the muscle, whether it is red or dusky, consistency, whether it is normal or friable, how well it is contracting to an electrical stimulus and whether it is bleeding or not. A most important point is sometimes you may do the fasciotomy under local anesthesia if you don't get a, if you do not get an OR. In those cases, you have to re release the compartments completely. The most frequent complications associated with fasciotomy is incomplete release of compartments. So, compartment syndrome can be seen in extremity in any particular part. Like in this case, the compartment syndrome of thigh. Thigh, as we know, is formed of three compartments. Anterior, medial and posterior. The anterior compartment is mainly consist of quadriceps and sartorius muscle of which the main neurovascular supply is the femoral nerve and the saphenous nerve, femoral vein. Whereas the medial compartment is, consist, is mainly composed of the adductor group of muscles. And it is supplied by the obturator nerve and part of profunda femoris whereas the posterior compartment is the uh, flexor of the knee which consists of hamstrings and the main supply is from the profunda femoris and uh, nerve supply is from the by the sciatic nerve so these accordingly the symptoms manifest if the anterior compartment is involved there will be pain on passive stretch on knee flexion and since quadriceps is involved, knee extension will be affected. And since sensory deficit will be in around L2, L3 and L4 region. Similarly, the posterior compartment, if it is involved, pain will be on the passive knee extension. And hamstring group of muscles are involved. So knee flexion is affected. And also, sometimes the great toe dorsiflexion is affected. So uh, sensory deficit is around at L5 and S1 whereas the medial compartment whose involvement is quite rare adductors will be involved so on abduction there will be pain on passive stretch. So if you want to decompress the thigh you decompress by a lateral route lateral lateral approach over the lateral intermuscular septum separating the vastus lateralis and the hamstring. So you decompress the anterior and posterior compartment. Involvement of medial compartment is rare. You, while decompressing the medial compartment, care has to be taken not to injure the neurovascular structures. If you have to decompress foot, you do it by a two incisions on the uh, dorsal aspect, one over the second metatarsal shaft, or uh, second along the fourth metatarsal shaft. In that, you decompress the superficial and deep com uh, compartments and the introsia and the lateral compartment. For a medial compartment, you go in by a medial incision, which can be from the extending from the medial malleolus along the uh, the same incision that is used for the fixation of calcaneus fracture. You can extend it further medially and decompress the medial compartment and the adductor halses. Forearm, which is second quite common cause of compartment syndrome after leg, can also be seen can be seen after distal radius or diaphyseal fracture, more commonly in children. Diaphyseal fracture in children is quite commonly complicated by acute compartment syndrome or RNS IV fluid administration or IV drug abuse. Sometimes also, it can also be seen in venomous bites, burns and facial closure. As we know there are three compartments in forearm 
the volar, the dorsal, and the mobile wad of Henry. So this can be decompressed by volar Henry approach or the dorsal Thompson approach. As we know, the volar approach can start from the you have to start from medial to biceps tendon and extend from the elbow grease and extend along the lister, extend along the radial styloid and simultaneously all the decompression of forearm has to decompress the carpal tunnel and the gyre canon to decompress the median and ulnar nerve respectively. So the approach can be from uh, in between intermuscular plane can be in between the F flexor carpi radialis and brachioradialis similar to the Henry's approach used for fixation of fractures. There is also a volar ulnar approach which extends between the FCU and ECU. Else, if it is not possible, you, we can also approach through a dorsal Thompson approach. And compartment syndrome, there are 10 compartments in hand, thenar and the hypothenar form the two compartments, whereas the dorsal and volar intrashe form the seven compartments in total, and adductor pollicis forms the last compartment. So, acute compartment syndrome in the hand, other than decompressing the nerves, through the median, uh, through the carpal tunnel and guidance canal, you, there are two incisions given along the second and fourth metatarsal on the volar aspect, and on the dorsal aspect, an incision is given over the thenar muscles. Similarly, all the compartments are decomposed. So, post fasciotomy wound care, they are left open for three to five days. And the second relook is done again, taking the patient to the OR, and a dial and a delayed primary closure can be done. This is one way of dealing with them, but nowadays it is more commonly dealt with negative pressure wound therapy, in which either a gauze or a polyurethane sponge is used, and pressures of about 100 to 120 mmHg continuous pressure is applied by which the wound margins approximate by themselves over a period of time. This dressing has to be changed only in about three to five days. There is no necessity of it to be uh, daily dressing changes are not needed in negative pressure wound therapy. Some complications with negative pressure wound therapy are dehiscence after the closure of the wound and heterotopic ossification. Sometimes some infections can also be increased if they have not been properly debrided before applying negative pressure wound therapy. Simultaneously, while doing fasciotomy, you, we can also fix the fractures, especially in the case of the forearm fractures or the tibial diaphyseal fractures. Fractures can be fixed in all cases except in the foot and ankle or the calcaneal fractures, where you have to wait for 7 to 21 days and let the swelling subside and only then we should fix them. But in some cases of open fracture or combat injuries, a monolateral external fixator can be used, needed. And I already told you that NPWT or shoelace or Roman sandal technique can be used for closure or both can be used simultaneously. And if still the raw area remains after a particular amount of time, then it can be closed with a split skin graft or if a nerve or tendon is exposed, then you can use a rotational or transpositional flaps. Complications of compartment syndrome. Most important reason for failure is a delay in diagnosis or a missed diagnosis, which can quite commonly occur in polytrauma patients. It is said that the perfusion pressure of less than 30 mmHg, if it lasts for more than 6 to 8 hours, significantly increases sequelae leading to poor prognosis. Sequelae as we have seen can be muscle contractures or weakness of muscles or sensory loss, infection and non-union of the fractures. In some missed cases, they may go into systemic sepsis which may need or further necessitate an amputation. In forearm, it can quite commonly lead to an Volkman ischemic contraction. Thank you. Thank you for watching this video. You can like and subscribe the channel.